The Revolution of Everyday Life by Raoul Vanagim, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. Uh, this, I believe, is part two and chapter two. So part two, Impossible Participation or Power as the Sum of Constraints. Chapter two, Humiliation. The economy of everyday life is based on a continuous exchange of humiliations and aggressive attitudes. It conceals a technique of wear and tear, which is itself prey to the gift of destruction, which it invites contradictorily. Today, the more man is a social being, the more he is an object. Decolonization has not yet begun. It will have to give a new value to the old principle of sovereignty. One day when Rousseau was traveling through a crowded village, he was insulted by a yokel whose spirit delighted the crowd. Rousseau, confused and discountenanced, couldn't think of a word in reply and was forced to take to his heels amidst the jeers of the crowd. By the time he had finally regained his composure and thought of a thousand possible retorts, any one of which would have silenced the joker once and for all, he was at two hours' distance from the village. Aren't most of the trivial incidents of everyday life like this ridiculous adventure? But in an attenuated and diluted form, reduced to the duration of a step, a glance, a thought, experienced as a muffled impact, a fleeting discomfort, barely registered by consciousness, and leaving in the mind only the dull irritation at a loss to discover its own origin— the endless minuet of humiliation in its response gives human relationships an obscene hobbling rhythm. In the ebb and flow of the crowds sucked in and crushed together by the coming and going of suburban trains and coughed out into streets, offices, factories, there is nothing but timid retreats, brutal attacks, smirking faces, and scratches delivered for no apparent reason. Soured by unwanted encounters, wine turns to vinegar in the mouth. Innocent and good-natured crowds? What a laugh. Look how they bristle up, threaten on every side, clumsy and embarrassed in the enemy's territory, far, very far from themselves. Lacking knives, they learn to use their elbows and their eyes. There is no intermission, no truce between attackers and attacked. A flux of barely perceptible signs assails the walker, who is not alone. Remarks, gestures, glances, tangle and collide, miss their aim, ricochet like bullets fired at random, which kill even more surely by the continuous nervous tension they produce. All we can do is to enclose ourselves in embarrassing parentheses, like these fingers. I am writing this on a cafe terrace, which slide the tip across the table and the fingers of the waiter, which pick it up while the faces of the two men involved, as if anxious to conceal the infamy which they have consented to, assume an expression of utter indifference. From the point of view of constraint, everyday life is governed by an economic system in which the production and consumption of insults tends to balance out. The old dream of, theorists, of the theorists of perfect competition thus finds its real perfection in the customs of a democracy given new life by the lack of imagination of the left, isn't it strange at first sight to see the fury with which progressives attack the ruined edifice of free enterprise, as if the capitalists, its official demolition gang, had not themselves already planned its nationalized reconstruction? But it is not so strange, in fact, for the deliberate purpose of keeping all attention fastened on critiques which have already been overtaken by events. After all, anybody can see that capitalism is gradually finding its fulfillment and a planned economy of which the Soviet model is nothing but a primitive form, is to conceal the fact that the only reconstruction of human relationships envisaged in one, or is one based upon precisely this economic model, which, because it is obsolete, is available at a knockdown price. Who can fail to notice the alarming persistence with which socialist countries continue to organize life along bourgeois lines? Everywhere, it's hats off to family, marriage, sacrifice, work, inauthenticity, inauthenticity, while simplified and rationalized homeostatic mechanisms reduce human relationships to fair exchanges of, def of deference and humiliation. 
And soon, in the ideal democracy of the cyber cyberneticians, everyone will earn without apparent effort a share of unworthiness, which which he will have the leisure to distribute according to the finest rules of justice. Distributive justice will reach its apogee. Happy the old men who live to see the day. For me and for some others, I dare to think, there can be no equilibrium in malaise. Planning is only the antithesis, antithesis of the free market. Only exchange has been planned, and with it the mutual sacrifice which it entails. But if the word innovation is to keep its proper meaning, it must mean superseding, not turning up. In fact, a new reality can only be based on the principle of the gift. Despite their mistakes and their poverty, I see in the historical experience of workers' councils, 1917, 1921, 1934, and 1956, and in the pathetic search for friendship and love, a single and inspiring reason not to despair over present reality. Everything conspires to keep secret the positive character of such experiences. Doubt is cunningly maintained as to their real importance, even their existence. By a strange oversight, no historian has ever taken the trouble to study how people actually lived during the most extreme revolutionary moments. At such times, the wish to make an end of free exchange in the market of human behavior shows itself spontaneously, but in the form of negation. When malaise is brought into question, it shatters under the onslaught of a greater and denser malaise. In a negative sense, Ravachal's bombs, or closer to our own time, the epic of Karakamata, dispel the confusion which reigns around the total rejection. Manifested to a varying extent, but manifested everywhere, of relationships based on exchange and compromise. I have no doubt since I have experienced it so many times that anyone who passes an hour in the cage of constraining relationships feels a profound sympathy for Pierre-Francois Lassenaer and his passion for crime. The point here is not to make an apology for terrorism, but to recognize it as an action, the most pitiful action and at the same time the most noble, which is capable of disrupting and thus exposing the self-regulating mechanisms of the hierarchical social community. Inscribed in the logic of an unlivable society, murder thus conceived can only appear as the concave form of the gift. It is that absence of an intensely desired presence that Mallarmé described. The same Mallarmé who, at the trial of the Thirty, called the anarchists angels of purity. My sympathy for the solitary killer ends where tactics begin, but perhaps tactics need scouts driven by individual despair. However, that may be the new revolutionary tactics, which will be based indissolubly on the historical tradition and on the practice, so widespread and so disregarded, of individual realization, will have no place for people who only want to mimic the gestures of Ravachal or Bonat. But on the other hand, these tactics will be condemned to theoretical hibernation, if they cannot, by other means, attract collectively the individuals whom isolation and hatred for the collective lie have already won over to the rational decision to kill or to kill themselves. No murderers and no humanists either. The first accept death, the second impose it. Let ten men meet who are resolved on the lightning of violence rather than the long agony of survival. From this moment, despair ends and tactics begin. Despair is the infantile disorder of the revolutionaries of everyday life. I still feel today my adolescent admiration for outlaws, not because of an obsolete romanticism, but because they expose the alibis by which social power avoids being put right on the spot. Hierarchical social organization is like a gigantic racket whose secret, precisely exposed by anarchist terrorism, is to place itself out of reach of the violence it gives rise to by consuming everybody's energy in a multitude of irrelevant struggles. A humanized power cannot allow itself recourse to the old methods of war and genocide. The witnesses for the prosecution can hardly be suspected of anarchist tendencies. The biologist Hans Selly states that as specific causes of disease, microbes, undernourishment, 
disappear. A growing proportion of people die of what are called stress diseases or diseases of degeneration caused by stress. That is, by the wear and tear resulting from conflicts, shocks, nervous tension, irritations, debilitating rhythms. From now on, no one can escape the necessity of conducting his own investigation into the racket which pursues him even into his thoughts, hunts him down even in his dreams. The smallest details take on a major importance. Irritation, fatigue, rudeness, humiliation, qui bono. Who profits by them? And who profits by the stereotyped answers that Big Brother Common Sense distributes under the label of wisdom, like so many alibis? Shall I be content with explanations that kill me when I have everything to win in a game where all the cards are stacked against me? The handshake ties and unties the knot of encounters, a gesture at once curious and trivial, which the French quite accurately say is exchanged. Isn't it, isn't it in fact the most simplified form of the social contract? What guarantees are they trying to seal? These hands clasped to the right, to the left, everywhere, with a liberality that seems to make up for a total lack of conviction. That agreement reigns, that social harmony exists, that life in society is perfect. But what still worries us is this need to convince ourselves, to believe it by force of habit, to reaffirm it with the strength of our grip. Eyes know nothing of these pleasantries. They do not recognize exchange. When our eyes meet someone else's, they become uneasy, as if they could make out their own empty, soulless reflection in the other per person's pupils. Hardly have they met when they slip aside and try to dodge one another. Their lines of flight cross in an invisible point, making an angle whose acuteness expresses the divergence, the deeply felt lack of harmony. Sometimes unison is achieved and eyes connect. The beautiful parallel stare of royal couples in Egyptian sculpture. The misty melting gaze brimming with eroticism of lovers. Eyes which devour one another from afar. But most of the time the eyes repudiate the superficial agreement sealed by the handshake. Consider the popularity of the energetic reiteration of social agreement. The phrase, let's shake on it, indicates its commercial overtones. Isn't it a trick played on the senses, a way of dulling the sensitivity of the eyes so that they don't revolt against the emptiness of the spectacle? The good sense of consumer society has brought the old expression, see things my way, to its logical conclusion. Whichever way you look, you see nothing but things. Become as senseless and easily handled as a brick. That is what social organization is kindly inviting everyone to do. The bourgeoisie has managed to share out ir irritations more fairly, allowing a greater number of people to suffer them according to rational norms, economic, social, political, legal necessities. The splinters of constraint produced in this way have in turn fragmented the cunning and the energy devoted collectively to evading or smashing them. The revolutionaries of 1793 were great because they dared to usurp the unitary hold of God over the government of men. The proletarian revolutionaries drew from what they were defending a greatness that they could never have seized from the bourgeois enemy. Their strength derived from themselves alone. A whole ethic based on exchange value, the pleasures of business, the dignity of labor, restrained desires, survival, and on their opposites, pure value, the gratuitous parasitism, instinctive brutality, and death. This is the filthy tub that human faculties have been bubbling in for nearly two centuries. From these ingredients refined a little, of course, the cybernet from these ingredients refined a little, of course, the cyberneticians are dreaming of cooking up the man of the future. Are we quite sure that we haven't yet arrived at the security of perfectly adapted beings, moving about as uncertainly and unconsciously as insects? For some time now, there have been experiments with sublimin subliminal advertising, the insertion into films of single frames lasting one twenty-fourth of a second, which are seen by the eye but not registered by consciousness. The first slogans give more than a glimpse of what is to come. Don't drive too fast and go to church. But what does a minor improvement like this represent in comparison with the whole immense conditioning machine, 
each of whose cogs, town planning, publicity, ideology, culture, is capable of dozens of comp comparable improvements. Once again, knowledge of the conditions which are going to continue to be imposed on people if they don't look out is less relevant than the sensation of living in such degradation now. Zamiatin's We, Huxley's Brave New World, Orwell's 1984, and Terrain's uh, Cinquième Coup de Trompette push back into the future, a shudder of horror which one look at the present would produce. And it is the present that develops consciousness and the will to refuse. Compared with my present imprisonment, the future holds no interest for me. The feeling of humiliation is nothing but the feeling of being an object. Once it has been understood as such, it becomes the basis for a combative lucidity for which the critique of the organization of life cannot be separated from the immediate inception of the project of living differently. Construction can begin only on the foundation of individual despair and its supersession. The efforts made to disguise this despair and pass it off under another wrapper are enough to prove it. What is the illusion which stops us seeing the disintegration of values, the ruin of the world, inauthenticity, non-totality? Is it, is it that I think that I am happy? Hardly. Such a belief doesn't stand up to analysis any better than it withstands the blasts of anguish. On the contrary, it is a belief in the happiness of others, an inexhaustible source of envy and jealousy which gives us a vicarious feeling of existence. I envy, therefore I am. To define oneself by reference to others is to define oneself as other, and the other is always object. So that life is measured in degrees of humiliation the more you live, the more you live the orderly life of things. Here is the cunning of reification by which it passes undetected like arsenic in the jam. The gentleness of these methods of oppression throws a certain light on the perversion which prevents me from shouting out, the emperor has no clothes, each time the sovereignty of my everyday life reveals its poverty. Obviously, police brutality is still going strong, to say the least. Everywhere it raises its head, the kindly souls of the left quite rightly condemn it. But what do they do about it? Do they urge people to arm themselves? Do they call for legitimate reprisals? Do they encourage pig hunts, like the one which decorated the trees of Budapest with the finest fruits of the Avo? No, they organize peaceful demonstrations at which their trade union police force their trade union police force treats anyone who questions their orders as an agent provocateur. The new policemen are ready to take over. The social psychologists will govern without truncheons. No more tough cops, only con cops. Oppressive violence is about to be transformed into a host of reasonably distributed pinpricks. The same people who denounce police violence from the heights of their lofty ideals are urging us on toward a state based on polite violence. Humanism merely upholsters the machine of Ka Kafka's penal colony. Less grinding and shouting. Blood upsets you? Never mind. Men will be bloodless. The promised land of survival will be the realm of peaceful death, and it is this peaceful death that the humanists are fighting for. No more Genrikas, no more Auschwitzes, no more Hiroshimas, no more Setifs. Hooray! But what about the impossibility of living? What about the stifling mediocrity and this absence of passion? What about the jealous fury in which the rankling of never being ourselves drives us to imagine that other people are happy? What about this feeling of never really being inside your own skin? Let nobody say these are minor details or secondary points. There are no negli negligible irritations. Gangrene can start in the slightest grays. The crises that shake the world are not fundamentally different from the conflicts in which my actions and thoughts confront the hostile forces that entangle and deflect them. How could it be otherwise when history in the last analysis is only important to me insofar as it affects my own life? Sooner or later, the continual division and redivision of aggravations will split the atom of unlivable reality and liberate a nuclear energy which nobody suspected behind so much passivity and gloomy resignation. That which produces the common good is always terrible. 
From 1945 to 1960, colonialism was a fairy godmother to the left. With a new en enemy on the scale of fascism, the left never had to define itself positively. Starting from itself, there was nothing there. It was able to affirm itself by negating something else. In this way, it was able to accept itself as a thing, part of an order of things in which things are everything and nothing. Nobody dared to announce the end of colonialism for fear that it would spring up all over the place like a jack-in-the-box whose lid doesn't shut properly. In fact, from the moment when the collapse of colonial power revealed the colonial colonialism inherent in all power over men, the problems of race and color became about as important as crossword puzzles. What effect did the clowns of the left have as they trotted about on their anti-racialist and anti-anti-Semitic hobby horses? In the last analysis, that of smothering the cries of tormented Jews and Negroes, which were uttered by all those who were not Jews or Negroes, starting with the Jews and Negroes themselves. Of course, they would not dream of questioning the spirit of generosity, which has inspired recent anti-racialism. But I lose interest in the past as soon as I can no longer affect it. I am speaking here and now, and nobody can persuade me, in the name of Alabama or South Africa and their spectacular exploitation, to forget that the epicenters of such problems lies in me and in each being who is humiliated and scorned by every aspect of our own society. I shall not renounce my share of violence." Human relationships can hardly be discussed in terms of more or less tolerable conditions, more or less admissible indignities. Qualification is irrelevant. Do racial insults hurt more than a word of command? When he is summoned, told off, or ordered around by a policeman, a boss, an authority, who doesn't feel deep down in moments of lucidity that he is a... Oh, darky and a gook. The old colonials provided us with a perfect identikit portrait of power when they predicted the descent into bestiality and wretchedness of those who found their presence undesirable. Law and order come first, says the guard to the prisoner. Yesterday's anti-colonialists are trying to humanize the generalized col colonialism of power. They become its watchdogs in the cleverest way, by barking at all the after-effects of past inhumanity. Before he tried to get himself made president of Martinique, Aimé Césaire made a famous remark. The bourgeoisie has found itself unable to solve the major problems which its own existence has produced, the colonial problem and the problem of the proletariat. He forgot to add, for they are one and the same problem, a problem which anyone who separates them will fail to understand. I read in Gouy's Histoire de France the slightest insult to the king meant immediate death. In the American constitution, the people are sovereign. In Puget's Père Penard, kings get fat off their sovereignty while we are starving on ours. Courbon's Secret du, du Peuple tells me, the people today means the mass of men to whom all respect is denied. Here we have, in a few lines, the misadventures of the principle of sovereignty. Kings designated as subjects, the objects of their arbitrary will. No doubt this was an attempt to wrap the radical inhumanity of its domination in a humanity of idyllic bonds. The respect due to the king's person cannot in itself be criticized. It is odious only because it is based on the right to humiliate by subordination. Contempt rotted the thrones of kings. But what about the citizens' sovereignty, the rights multiplied by bourgeois vanity and jealousy, sovereignty distributed like a dividend to each individual? What about the divine right of kings democratically shared out? Today, France contains 24 million mini-kings, of which the greatest, the bosses, are great only in their ridiculousness. The sense of respect has become degraded to the point where humiliation is all that it demands. Democratized into public functions and roles, the monarchic principle floats with its belly up like a dead fish. Only its most repulsive aspect is visible. Its will to be absolutely and unreservedly superior has disappeared. Instead of basing our lives on our sovereignty, we try to base our sovereignty, sovereignty 
on other people's lives, the manners of slaves.